and we'll get things going. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Welcome to CNCF's live webinar, Kubernetes Data Protection Requires Orchestration, Canister.io Delivers. I'm Libby Schultz and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm gonna read our code of conduct and then hand over to Michael Corsi, Solution Architect, Principal Cloud Native Project Manager, both with Cast in by Veeam. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you are not able to speak as an attendee, but there is a chat box down the right hand sidebar where you can leave any of your questions. Um, feel free to drop them in there. We'll get to as many as we can at the end. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. And please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today to the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link and the recording will be available on our online programs YouTube playlist. With that, I will hand things over to Michael and Mark. Thank you, Libby. All right. Hello, everybody. So uh, Michael and I, we'll, we'll just add a little bit more, but we both represent uh, Kasten, which has been a CNCF Platinum sponsor for a number of years. We're always at KubeCon, so come and find us. We have a number of open source projects, one of which we will speak today about, as well as uh, contributing directly to Kubernetes itself. We'll show you that at the end with the resources. But uh, I'm coming to you today from Austin, Texas. And Michael, where are you based? Um, I'm living in a part of France called Normandia that you Americans guys should know for good reasons. Yeah. Yes. And Michael, give us a tiny bit uh, more of your career, if you would. Yes, yeah, sure. So I've been a JEE architect for a few years. So I was really on the development side. Then I start to help different teams with their DevOps process. And one day, Kubernetes entered the scene. And we had to deal with that. And uh, uh, we, we had to deal the, the protection of the workloads on Kubernetes. That was one of my tasks. And we were looking for solutions like Kubernetes, Kasten, and other kind of solutions for protecting workload on Kubernetes. And then I naturally moved to Kasten, which is a, a tool really, uh, really focused on that. So mainly now I can describe myself like a solution architect at Kasten. I help our customer to deploy Kasten on their on their infrastructure and to integrate with the different kind of database that they have to manage and these different kind of process. Yeah, not speaking too much about me, but that's, that, that's yes, a good summary of what I'm doing now. Great, and that's exactly where Canister comes in, you know, customizing solutions to do data protection operations, which is exactly the heart of our presentation today. So we'll give you a quick overview of what data protection challenges are on Kubernetes uh, and then how Canister helps solve that problem. Uh, we'll wind up with some conclusions, give you all the resources that we've cited in this presentation, including a GitHub repository with the demonstration code, and then we'll get to your Q&A. All right, let's get started. So when we start talking to people about how do they solve their organization's ability to continue running no matter what. Uh, we get into all of the, the challenges of data protection and the, the time honored rule is the three to one backup strategy. You need three kind of online backups of, of your data in two different locations and one of those has to be at least offsite or offline in fact. Um, so bringing that forward into the cloud native world with Kubernetes uh, really shows a whole new set of challenges for these old problems, which is that we see our customers and our, our prospects all at different stages of adopting Kubernetes and their maturity with cloud operations. So we're going to get into all of that. Uh, stateful versus stateless workloads, why a lot of people think Etsy backup is the way to protect Kubernetes, but it's not. 
what is an actual application consistent backup and why would you need to do that instead of backing up a Kubernetes cluster? And ultimately how we're going to get you to exactly to how Canister solves this problem in an open source manner to give you application consistent data protection. So first and foremost, I'll, I'll actually show you, uh, this is the data on Kubernetes community report. We'll link to this at the very end. We see basically everybody growing for the last couple of years to get past stateless applications and finally add stateful applications, which means that they have storage. It means that their state is important. And we'll talk about exactly those workloads. But as soon as you're successful with Kubernetes, more and more workloads, more and more complex workloads, and more and more traditional workloads follow there on. Uh, so we see that growth exploding. So the, the first myth and question a lot of people come up when they meet us is, well, isn't everything stateless on Kubernetes? Why do I need backup, recovery, disaster recovery, and so on? And the answer is the cluster itself has a lot of state, not just etcd, which we'll get to in just a moment, but actually all of the secrets, all of the configuration. And when we go even back to 2020, the CNCF found that 55% of their uh, respondents were already running stateful workloads. We know that that has grown quite a bit since then. The majority of those workloads, I'll just jump ahead also, are primarily databases that are stateful. And we see even a third of, of everybody at, back in 2022 uh, already running many different variations of basically databases and stateful caches. So getting back to this, uh, another workload that we see more recently growing a lot is even traditional virtual machines running on top of Kubernetes with the Kubevert uh, project, another CNCF project, uh, is also another growing workload that is incredibly stateful. And the reasons for that are as many, but ultimately our customers' workloads grow and they grow in their complexity and they bring more traditional workloads on. But the next step is that, well, it's not just enough to have uh, if you don't even have stateful workloads, it's not enough to present everything as being stateless because you, in many organizations and in many industries, you must regulate, you must be able to audit, you must be able to be prove what the cluster configuration was and get or, or doing it by hand or just a wiki document is not enough. Actually backing up and restoring, having the ability to restore your workloads uh, and the configuration is required for audit purposes. That's all there is. And if you're not at the point where you need to be audited, uh, you, if you are successful, you certainly will get there. Um, Michael, you wanna join? add anything here? Yes, what about you said that um, everything is in GitOps does not mean that uh, everything is actually um, in, the, in, in the Kubernetes cluster. So, so what you said um, about the intent everything should be like GitOps said, and what you really have is there is a real distance. Uh, from a legal point of view, you can't say, uh, I have the proof that my state was this one, because look, my GitOps, my GitOps things is like this. You need to prove that on Kubernetes, it was like that, and only on Kubernetes. So Kubernetes basically is the source of truth. And from my experience, what I can say is even if the good organization have a very good GitOps process, when you are facing urgency, uh, when you are facing obsolescence of an application, when you are facing sometimes ignorance, many people, many, we, we see many cases where people are changing things manually. So they deploy their GitOps process then they do some manual change. And it's very important to be able to track that as well. Even if you don't have stateful workload, as you said. Agreed, agreed. So we, we fully endorse GitOps, but you need to add uh, the ability to audit. And more importantly, do disaster recovery to keep your business running or keep your data uh, because the configuration in code is not enough, right? We always have our persistence. And so that's that's what we see over and over and over again. And our business is growing uh, roughly double just last year alone. So 
yes, this is the reality. And the final myth that we also have to explain to customers is that just because they're on public cloud, which has great uptime, don't get me wrong, they're not fully protected, right? They have outages. They still need to satisfy audit requirements. And ultimately, every public cloud provider wants you to do disaster recovery can be to another area inside that public cloud, of course. But we have many of our customers trying to figure out how to do multi-cloud using Kubernetes to be able to do hybrid and multi-cloud workloads. And so ultimately, uh, disaster recovery and auditability and stateful workloads is the maturity uh, journey that everybody takes. And we hope you're along those lines too, because you will need canister later on. So we've covered this very briefly. We'll have links for these at the very end. Uh, so let's get to the next uh, major concern that most people have. You know, when they learn about Kubernetes, one of the first things they, they learn is how to get onto the cluster uh, and then how to insert, you know, uh, custom resources. And then they hear that, you know, backing up etcd is the way to preserve the state of everything. And while this is true, however, in reality, we have never seen anybody successfully do etcd backup and restore all back to that cluster once a cluster is in a bad state. That's all there is to it. Um, I'm happy to be disproved, but I would even argue, even if I'm wrong, that's a 1% use case. Uh, we see that customers do use etcd backup for forensics and audits, even development and test kind of scenarios, but restoring etcd in production when the cluster is constantly drifting, constantly changing its state, and etcd is only as good a, as the last backup that you did, and when you do the restoral, you'll go back to that point in time, but that doesn't represent where the cluster is, that drift is not represented well. So uh, in practice, also, the Kubernetes project is trying to lock down the control plane as much as possible such that you don't have access to even do etcd backups. Hmm. So, uh, and, and all the other Kubernetes vendors are doing this as well. So we only would advocate if you are, are, are beholden to this strategy, you need to test whether or not it actually works. You're only good as your last restoral. But the truth is that this is not the right way to actually do backup recovery and disaster recovery or auditability. Uh, it's part of it, uh, but it's not sufficient. Uh, Michael, yeah. anything to add here? Yeah, I would say that if you are in the situation where you think, oh, I should restore ETCD, it's most of the time it's too late. You are already in a very, very bad situation. It's, it's really too late. The best is to rebuild another cluster somewhere and to restart your application and from your backup. Uh, that, that's a better, much better strategy. If you have a backup system, recreate your application, your, your, your Kubernetes cluster somewhere else and uh, restore your application, but don't try to restore the ETCD backup. I must say that I've been an open shift administrator for three years. I never, ever restore an ETCD backup. Never. It never happened. I never need to do that. Sometimes I lose some clusters. Hopefully I have backup, but I never try to recover from an ETCD backup. It's just a bad idea. Yeah. And that's not to say you can't use GitOps to populate things on that new cluster, of course, but you'll need to ultimately restore the state as well. And not or. So this is where we get to the final contention and the takeaway that we'd like you to have is that really the applications on a Kubernetes cluster is what's important. The clusters should become cattle, should become ephemeral, should not be the logical concern of how you do backup recovery and auditing. Uh, it is one of the logical concerns, of course, but the applications themselves, their state and their configuration, that is what everybody is after. So um, when you approach this from an operation standpoint or a traditional backup standpoint or an infrastructure standpoint, Kubernetes allows us to finally deal with the entire vertical uh, stack, top to bottom, application infrastructure and all the operations together. This is revelatory for a lot of people, but they still approach the ability to maintain their business in, in traditional ways. And so this is no longer necessary. And again, Canister will help us solve this, but let's justify exactly why we need to talk about application consistent backups. Well, most people think that once they have persistent workloads and persistent volume 
and their persistent volume claims that all they need to do with CSI snapshots, uh, volume snapshots, is that's good enough. But the truth is, while that may be a crash consistent snapshot of the storage on disk at that point in time, it is often, and I would argue almost always, never good enough, right? So while you can bypass CSI, uh, container storage interface, and go directly with your storage provider and use their volume snapshots, uh, that's one thing some of our customers do. A second stage that a lot of our customers try to do to make it a more generic operation across any storage provider so that they can go multi-cloud, uh, multi-provider, and even multi-versions of Kubernetes, right? As you know, CSI changes, everything changes. Uh, even that etcd backup between different versions of Kubernetes won't work potentially. Um, we see generic backup being the next uh, solution that most people do where they mount a file system and just basically take copy every file. Uh, but this, and the next step, which was the traditional CSI volume snapshot, all of these have failures for crash consistency in the sense that until the application and all the data is at rest on that storage medium, you do not have a proper backup. You certainly will restore it and not get what you thought. So we see backups and restorals fail because the backups weren't crash consistent and application consistent. So the next level up from that is logical backups where you use the application's backup facility if it exists or even the backup operator if it exists as a way to uh, do an application consistent backup. And this is certainly a better state, but we'll show you that it's not the final state of, of how to achieve this properly. So what we see, you know, let's say you uh, mount a MySQL container uh, in a pod and you do MySQL dump on it and you need to get that artifact off. What happens is those databases, those, those uh, logical backups, those files grow and grow and grow and grow, and they don't become incremental. Uh, you have to figure out a whole new way to manage everything in order to even get to incremental. And why would we need incremental backups? Because now we need to bring down the database, get everything logically flushed on disk, and, and get going. Well, actually, I'm getting ahead of us. That's the system backup. Um, long story short is that this is a good first step, but actually not good enough and not state of the art of what we have in the more traditional area of bare metal and VMs for backup. So system backups are really where we are uh, in that world, more traditional world. And we don't have that exactly on Kubernetes. This is where Canister comes in. We need to actually stop the application, lock uh, the application or, or flush everything to, to storage, right? one way or another, or a combination of all these things, bring things in and out of load balancers, scale up and scale down uh, everything to make sure no transactions are in flight, and then a CSI volume snapshot works. And then we need to invert all those operations to orchestrate everything, to unlock everything, and get the application back to a fully running state. This is where we go, but once we have this orchestrated set of operations for system backups, we need to then orchestrate all those notions and then figure out how to do deltas or incremental backups because that's how we get to shortest backup windows and the least amount of storage required for all that backup and recovery. So this is where that complexity of orchestration comes in for an application consistent backup. And that's how you finally win to get to what everybody expects to happen on Kubernetes but is not currently the state of the art for performance, storage efficiency, and so on. Any, any other uh, comments you might have there? Oh, um, yes, all you said is so true. I could just add a little thing. Please. Is, uh, in my experience, when the, when the storage is, uh, is not working anymore, because it happens sometimes that you lose the storage for many reasons, most of the time, the snapshot is not working anymore as well. You are not able to restore from the snapshot. And you absolutely need uh, an offsite copy of your backup. So mm -hmm. just leaving, well, you already said that, but I'm, I'm just saying that yeah. it's, it's a common pattern to see that uh, when you have a disaster, it's uh, often a storage disaster, and you can't, you just can't use your your snapshot anymore. So it's not always the case, but but it's a it's a common pattern, unfortunately. So great, we've now shown you everything that you need to achieve on your journey to get to mature data protection on Kubernetes, all the characteristics of that solution. But 
let's describe exactly how we can start to address this, right? As, as Michael, you were, you were going to tell me a little bit about how, how you used to solve things in, in a quick and dirty way. Could you, could you do that or, or oh, take yeah. it? Yes, I can, I can give you uh, my experience. So, so I remember on the first time we were doing all our Kubernetes cluster on AWS. So we had the EBS storage available. And our first solution was to create a script. It was a, it was a Lambda function on AWS. And we were taking a snapshot of every EBS uh, volume, and that was our solution. And one day, we had a disaster, and we had to recover. And I remember that it was a nightmare, because it was very difficult to make the relationship between the EBS volume snapshot and the actual PVC that is running on, on the application. So we had to uh, recreate this remapping, this mapping. It was very difficult. Also, uh, we were dealing with a lot of solutions for, uh, for storing the backup. So on the first place, we were storing things on AWS S3. But then for legal reasons, we were told that we should send the backup on on-prime uh, S3 storage. So we had to change all the code to make that possible. And we even have to to rewrite the library. So that was a, a, a real pain. And uh, also, how can we, how could we handle the logical backup? For example, when you try to, uh, to backup a MySQL database with MySQL dump, you need to establish a connection between your client and your database. So how do you do that? Um, do you create a port forward? Do you open a route and do you do you try to do that on the Kubernetes cluster? All these questions were pretty difficult to, to solve. And we quickly felt that for all those, all those reasons, uh, we, needed, we needed a framework. We needed something generic, something that solved this problem properly. Right, and so we, we've enumerated some of the problems that our customers typically have when they do a quick and dirty backup script, right? Uh, it may actually work. That's not the issue. The issue is, does it work for everybody else? Is it available? Does, is it flexible? Are you, are you going to maintain it? Who else has the skill sets to run it? Is it delegated to everybody else in this world of DevOps and platform ops? Can a developer run it? Uh, who can run it at four in the morning when you are on vacation and so on, right? So this goes on and on and on, and that's why we, we have a company, but Canister, will show you next, starts to address all of this as that flex flexible framework that gets you an application consistent backup. So let's go on to the next slide. And we'll show you at Canister now. So as, as alluded to, you want to be able to work with any sort of application, right? You can't hard code everything for one application in one cluster in one provider. Uh, it just won't scale. So Canister is a cloud-native solution. It's an open source project. It's Apache 2 license. It's available on GitHub. Uh, it is, it follows the Kubernetes operator pattern in the sense that you can use a Helm chart to install the Canister controller onto your Kubernetes cluster. It introduces three new custom resource definitions, uh, which are basically a, a blueprint, a profile, and an action set. Michael, could you take us into a little bit more detail about how we use it? Yes, yes, yes. So to start uh, from something simple, the profile is where you put your data. Is it on an S3 bucket? Is it on an Azure blob? Is it on a Google bucket? Is it on the S3 compatible bucket? Where? In which region? With which credentials? So profile is all about that. So when we do uh, a backup, we give a profile information so that the backup system know where to put the backup. Then come the blueprint. So the blueprint is really the, you can see that blueprint and action sets, they always come together. The blueprint, you can see that as a library of functions, 
like uh, functions that define a backup, a restore, or the deletion of, a, of an artifact. And an action set is the actual invocation of a blueprint action. So you can see blueprint like a function or library of a function, an action set like uh, an invocation of this function. So you always create an action set saying on which workload I'm working on, with which blueprint, which action on the blueprint, and which profile. These three things create the backup orchestration activity. So that's, that's how we, that's how I would, I would define these uh, three big uh, custom resources. Yeah. Awesome. And remember, the whole goal of this for disaster recovery is to get those backup artifacts off of the cluster. It wants to be disaster recovered any place else. Right. So most customers uh, bring down uh, example blueprints. They customize them for their need. They upload it after putting canister, installing canister on their cluster. They upload some blueprints. They set their profile configurations. And then the action sets are the actual invocations. Uh, that we trace for the life cycle of executing a blueprint with its runtime arguments and its profiles to do a backup, delete, or other CRUD-like uh, create, read, update, delete type operation for your artifacts, application by application. All right, so that's a quick overview of what it does. Let's get a little bit more detailed. So how do you interact? Once you've installed Canister on, onto a Kubernetes cluster, usually, you can use a uh, cube cuddle or cube CTL. Uh, this is a religious discussion on how to pronounce that. But we also have a, a canister CLI tool called can cuddle, uh, which also helps with the facilitate with the uh, life cycle of blueprints, profiles, and action sets. Uh, but you can use cube cuddle as well. So once we actually have loaded on blueprints, loaded on profiles, uh, those CRDs onto a cluster, the canister controller is constantly watching for action sets to be created. Uh, and once it does, those basically runtime arguments say, with this blueprint, do that action uh, with that profile and any other runtime arguments. And an example, the example we will be illustrating is with uh, MySQL, please back it up or restore it uh, to an S3 bucket. Very simple use case, uh, typical for everybody, but obviously we can change everything with the profile and we can do many more operations than just uh, backup uh, inside the blueprint. Okay, so we create an action set that invokes all of these things, binds all these things together. Uh, the cancer controller retrieves all those objects, the blueprint, the profile, et cetera, creates an action plan and then starts executing it. Those individual actions are, are examples of, of anything like a cube executive uh, or exec, executive type thing. So that can be a shell command, that can be everything we can do through cube cuddle, it can be any CLI, can be any API. And that's how we bind to not just what's inside the cluster, but anything outside of the cluster, because we do often have to orchestrate external systems, DNS, load balancers, et cetera. Um, it, canister controller continues to exec all each of those actions, do all those operations, ultimately, typically with our, our MySQL database instance in its pod and gets the uh, MySQL instance appropriately stopped, flushed to disk, uh, volume backup or logical backup, in this case, a MySQL dump, and we get it off of the cluster to the backup location, an S3. Uh, Canister tracks all, while executing all this, tracks everything, updates the uh, action set with its status. Ultimately, uh, when the artifact is created and exported off, we get that final state concludes uh, and returns that status back constantly. But we finally get a completed action set. And that's really roughly how Canister works. Anything I missed, Michael? No, 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 this is perfect. The, the only thing we I could add is the action set is how you're going to track your operations. Is the Every time you create a backup, you create a new action set. Every time you create a restore, you create a new action set, and so on. So if you want to get the history of all your backup and restore activities, you just follow the, uh, the list of action set, and you know what happened, and what failed, and what succeeded, and so on. Good. 
So shall we start showing everybody this in action now, Michael? Uh, certainly. All right, let me stop sharing and hand it over to oh, you. Let's go for a small demo. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. OK, cool. So this is going to be a really common line demo, but yeah, that's how we use canister. So I am deploying the solution on an OpenShift cluster. To be accurate, it's going to be on Arrow, which means uh, OpenShift on Azure. And I am on the namespace uh, MySQL test. On this namespace called MySQL test, I have uh, a M chart, which is deployed. Um, and this is a MySQL M chart. So I got a pod, which is uh, a stateful set. Actually, it's a, it's a pod of a stateful set. I, I do have a stateful set, of course. I also have a PVC because it's a stateful workload. And I also have secrets, which is the credential to the database, uh, which is this one. Um, now I can visit the content of the database just to show you that I do have some content inside. So let's uh, exact inside the, the pod of the stateful set and I'm going to connect to the database MySQL and let's see the database. I do have the usual database and also the test database, which is something that I created. And inside this test database, if I use this test database, I have some tables actually for the demo. It's uh, just one table, that's table. And if I do a select star, uh, yes, select star from pets, I can see one, one line of, uh, of a hamster. So all that to say that I have data in my database and I want to do a backup of my database. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, use canister for that. So first I need to create a profile. I already created a profile. So I can show you the profile that I created. Kubectl uh, get profiles. Yes, this one. So this one is a S3 profile, which which means that it's a, it's a S3 compatible. But actually, it's the it's a profile that point to a AWS S3 bucket. And I'm also having a blueprint. So the blueprint is how you define your operations when you do the backup. And the blueprint has been created by just creating a blueprint object. So I can find my blueprint. It's here. I can see my blueprint, the MySQL blueprint. And we're going to have a look to this blueprint very quickly, because this is not the goal of this presentation to go in the details of the blueprint, but we can just have a quick look about that. So a blueprint is made of different actions, a backup actions, a delete action when I delete my backup, and a restore action. So if I go to the backup action, let's see the important thing. Actually, it's a MySQL dump. So I'm doing a MySQL dump on my database, and I zip this dump and I push this dump to the profile. That's what I'm doing exactly. And once I'm good, I'm saving the path to this dump so that I can reuse that later. Now, uh, I can just do a demo of a backup. So what does it take to create a backup? So let's first grab the profile. Mm -hmm. 
let's make sure this one is good. PRO. Yes, correct. Okay, so yeah, the, the profile is there. And I'm going to create an action set, the famous action set that we've been speaking. So what I'm going to do is I'm invoking the backup action on the MySQL blueprint, which is living in the namespace Castanio, but it's to save the stateful set, which is living in the MySQL test namespace and having for name MySQL release. Then I will send all that to this profile location uh, that I, I already showed. So you see, doing a backup is become something very simple and very easy to follow. So now let's do it. Okay, let's go. Okay, reaction set has been created. You see its name is there. And I can grab the name in a variable to make it easier. Okay, so what we want to do is to follow up, see how the action set is going. And this is very simple. The only thing I have to do is to just do a get action set. And what I can see is the backup is complete. So it means that it succeeded. So let's have a look in this case. Um, let me take you to the bucket. And if I reload, I see a new folder. We are just seeing your uh, visual. Oh, code. I'm sorry. OK. I was showing you my <clears throat> AWS console. OK, well, why don't you cut over to that? I'll explain a tiny bit more. So because you can see the CLI invocation of this, there is a full API of it. So this is how you can put backup and recovery into GitOps, uh, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. We don't displace GitOps. We augment it with the data operations, the data protection operations uh, with Canister. And so, so you are, you are absolutely right. This is, this is an object. Uh, and we can see the content of this object. Uh, this is a, really a, a Kubernetes object. So it's an action set uh, with a name, with a namespace, and so on. And you can see the three component, the blueprint, the profile. And, uh, and no, that's all. The, the, uh, yes, the blueprint and the profile. And yes, and on which thing we are acting, the object. So the three elements, the blueprint, the object on which we are acting, and the profile. And in the status, you can see that um, we created the dump here on this uh, S3 bucket. And we, we've got a state, a status of the, the good completion of the, of the backup. So the state is complete here. So now let's imagine that I lose my data because, I don't know, I made a, a human error. It can happen. So let's imagine that I'm removing my uh, MySQL database. OK, if I do OC get po, you see that nothing. If I do OC get STS, nothing. And let's say that I also remove the PVC. So really, no chance. OC get PVC, now everything is gone. So I need to restore. So the first thing I'm going to do is to reinstall the, the whole thing, the database and the PVC. But this is going to be completely empty. There won't be anything inside this database. Let's, yeah, it's, We container creating, so we need to wait for the pod to be up and running. Now we're just doing this on the same cluster, but it could be any cluster at this point. Uh, yes, we could restore that in another cluster. Yeah, that would be perfectly possible. Uh, okay, so my pod is now running, and 
I could go inside the database and show you that the test database does not exist, that the pets table does not exist, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that you, you trust me. So now I'm going to uh, create a restoration. So this time, my approach would be different. I'm going to create, again, an action set, but I'm not going to define the profile, the blueprint, or uh, the object because I'm going to work from the previous action set. I want to restore the backup created in the previous action set. So the only thing I'm going to do is this, create an action set with the restore action and with the action set name. Um, so let's do it. And getting back to auditing, this is exactly how you can target the appropriate point in time action set record uh, to get the database back to where you need it for an audit purpose at any point in time. You just have to find the right action set. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Something that I did not show, um, but I could have, uh, OC get action set minus n cast an IO. It's where I put all my action set. You see many action sets. Uh, some of them failed because I was uh, just doing some fine tuning. Mm -hmm. um, so you can always list the different actions, the backup and my restore attempt and so on. So you can follow up your action. So let's do that now. Let's create a restore action. Yes, you can see we did a dry run of our restoral earlier today to make sure everything yeah. was working. <laughs> this season. So now, I, uh, yes, it's because we are introducing this no, a new CRD called the uh, repository server. But never mind. So everything works fine. I can grab the new action set. This one actually, the restore backup. But I want to put that in a variable easily. So I'm going to just execute this command. So the action set. Yes, this is the one. And if I check the value of this, this action set, uh, I'm sorry. You see that it's complete, which means that it's successful. And uh, the things I can do is now connect to the database and just check my data are back. So I'm going to connect to my pod, connect to my database, and uh, just check the database. Show data basis. And test is there. And I can just. Oh, no, let's just select star from pets. <laughs> uh, you're right. Yeah. Use uh, test. And uh, select uh, star from pets. And no surprise, we get back our world column still. Great. Uh, so to summarize, the once you have the framework is installed and the blueprint is ah, okay, the only thing you need to do to back up is this kubectl create an action set. And when you need to restore, the only thing you have to do is this. The restore consume the, uh, the previous action set, the backup action set. So yeah, that's, that's my demo for the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. All right, uh, if you would stop sharing, I'll finish up uh, everything. Uh, this one. Okay. All right. Uh, so let's 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 conclude and wrap up with what we had. So what we've shown is that Canister is a cloud-native, open-source, extensible framework for Kubernetes data protection. Uh, please adopt it. Please join us. Please improve it uh, by joining us at Canister.io. So we have community bi-weekly meetings on Zoom. Uh, we have a Slack channel uh, that you can join and ask questions. 
our, our engineering team uh, and many other customers and adopters are there. And so that's how the community interacts. And we figure out what we need to do next on the roadmap. For instance, I think I saw the complete percentage doesn't really seem to make sense. There might be some bugs there. Um, we have a partner in Cube Campus that does a lot of Kubernetes training and they have a tutorial for using Canister. Um, please come to canister.io and you'll be able to get to all of these references. Um, the MySQL database blueprint is available on our GitHub in the project. And today's webinar materials themselves, uh, the code that was executed uh, was, is also available there. Um, I've also linked over to the references that we cited earlier, the CNCF survey about going from stateless to stateful, uh, the, doc, the data on Kubernetes community uh, 2021 report for, again, increasing stateful workloads and which databases. Uh, the Datadog HQ, uh, HQ uh, container report also for more data in database insight. Um, we are actively involved with the Kubernetes community and Kubernetes engineering in the data protection working group. Um, that has a charter and a white paper on all of the data protection uh, concerns that are needed between the storage provider community, the application provider community, and so on. So please come and join us there. Uh, in particular, we are leading a lot of the effort for Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal 3314, which is to introduce change block tracking to the CSI volume snapshot uh, operation. And so if you're interested in, in helping us get that spread and adopted, please join us or even comment on the design. We are in prototype phase right now. So that gives you, I think, a great overview of what Canister does where it does it and how it does it, which is most important because we're helping all of our customers and all of our, all of the entire uh, CNCF and Kubernetes community grow in their data protection maturity such that they have disaster recovery in an application consistent way. Uh, and it's not easy, but with a community like this, we're solving it uh, and we're solving it at scale. So, Michael, any, any other final comments? I think that's it. We probably yeah. if there are yes. the, the last thing I would say from my experience, don't try to implement the backup solution yourself. Don't try to implement the backup framework or a very small, teeny backup framework of your own because it's an incredibly difficult problem to solve. It's better to rely on framework that have experience on this on this matter and we we do have a lot of experience on that and believe me the canister framework has been built right really built right but you need some experience and to to, to exercise to, to understand yeah we we'd like you to make mistakes with canister and recover from those mistakes and achieve uh data protection that much sooner rather than relearn all of the mistakes that we've already corrected with our community and proved in many more use cases outside of even what we imagined. Um, because we do data protection at Veeam uh, for traditional workloads and because uh, Kasten does it for Kubernetes in specific, we created Canister such that we didn't have to do a specific integration for each and every provider and each and every application. And this is leverageable by anybody in any scenario. So this is our contribution to the entire community and we hope you find it as valuable as we already have and our customers already have. All right, Libby, uh, how are we doing? We are doing good. We are ready for some Q and A. So if anyone has questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. And we have about 10 minutes to answer anything, any burning questions. So I think we did a good job on timing then. Excellent job. Anyone have questions for Mark and Michael? Well, either we did an excellent job uh, or people are still trying to figure out what's the right next question to ask. <laughs> well, long story short, as we said, uh, we've got lots of resources. Come to canister.io and, and learn about it. Uh, and. Not only that, you'll be able to get this entire uh, presentation and our, our video recording, uh, Libby, uh, hopefully a little later today. I'll send you a final version of these slides right after we finish. Yeah, perfect. All right, no questions. Is this our final offer? 
<laughs> you can reach out to Michael and myself through GitHub, through Twitter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, our first name dot last name at veeam.com. Awesome. Oh, here we go. If I lose not only app data, but also cluster as well, do I have to restore actions before I can use canister to restore data? This is a very good question. Yes, thank you for asking that. Uh, actually, I show you that I use the action set to recover. But this is not mandatory to create another action set. You can just uh, create an action set out of the blues. Uh, out of the blue, I'm sorry, not out of the blues. Uh, if I share my screen again, if you allow me to share my screen again. Yeah, stop sharing. Go ahead, Go ahead Michael. Yes. Um, and show this window as well. Okay. Um, if if I just execute the OC get the uh, action set. Blah. Action set minus n custom.io. This last one it was the restore one. Yes, okay. And now if I if I just check the content of this action set, you see that you can perfectly provide the information yourself. You don't have to uh, get back uh, to, 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 yes, you don't have to rebuild from a previous action set. You can just create this restore action set uh, directly by providing your information and that will work as well. So it's just uh, these things, the from is just to make it easier, but at the end, what you create is a plan, um, is a plan action set where you provide the artifact where you want, on which you want to work. Yeah, I hope this is answering the question. I, I'll add a tiny bit more there. So yeah, if you have a brand new cluster, um, you would need to get some basic things installed, such as canister, get those profiles and blueprints loaded, and then yeah. Uh, you can start with your action set. But that's a GitOps operation, in my opinion. Not hard to do. And we have the Helm chart, so like, really easy to do. Yeah. All right, then. I think, Libby, we'll, we'll thank you for your time. Thank you for uh, yeah. hosting us today. Well, thank you both, Mark and Michael. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And those of you who view this later, thanks for watching. Um, we'll get this up as soon as possible. And join us again for another live webinar with CNCF or all of our online programs that we post weekly. And thank you both so much again. And we'll see you next time, everyone. Thank you. Merci, Michael. Au revoir.